This is Michael Altos recording Opioids and Context Sensitive Halftime, Part 2. We spoke about the normal strong opioid agonists before. Now we're going to talk about a few specific instances. The first is meperidine, also known as Demerol. Meperidine is notable as the only op opioid that has some local anesthetic properties. And you can actually do a spinal anesthetic with meperidine. This is a question I've seen on board exams in the past. It does have a lot of similar effects to morphine, the sedation and the pinpoint pupils and the euphoria and the nausea and the dizziness, some histamine release. One special effect of meperidine is that it's very effective in reducing shivering, uh, re almost regardless of the cause of the shivering. And this is probably mediated through the kappa receptors. We use this drug as our first line treatment for post-operative shivering in PACU. It has an active metabolite called normeperidine, which is excreted in the urine. And this drug has a lot of negative CNS side effects. It can cause tremors and excitation and even seizures. And the recommendation for the maximum daily dose of meperidine is probably somewhere between 600 and 1,000 milligrams daily. Uh, we don't really use meperidine for pain anymore. Um, in our institution, uh, you're not even supposed to order it for pain, uh, really just for nausea. I'm sorry, really just for uh, shivering, rather. The drug is redistributed in about 4 to 15 minutes, and its elimination is in 3 to 5 hours. And the dose of meperidine is about 10 times that of morphine. So we use about 0.1 to 1 milligram per kilogram. And since we usually use it not for pain, but just for shivering, the common dose is somewhere between 12.5 and, and 50 milligrams IV. And you can repeat that dose a second time, usually after about 30 minutes if the shivering continues. Fentanyl is a drug that we're all very familiar with. Fentanyl and its related medications, sufentanyl, alfentanyl, are all synthetic mu receptor agonists. Fentanyl is about 100 times more potent than morphine. It can reduce your MAC by 50 to as much as 70% at proper doses. Fentanyl is extremely lipid soluble and it rapidly crosses membranes. And that's why it has such a fast onset and such a fast redistribution. It's very protein bound which is a pH-dependent process. So as patients become acidotic, the drug will actually unbind and more free drug will be available, so you'll get a stronger effect. It's metabolized in the liver uh, rapidly with a high extraction ratio. At very high doses, so say 100 micrograms per kilogram, so just to put that in perspective, 100 micrograms per kilogram in a 100 kilogram person would be 10,000 micrograms of fentanyl. So this used to be done regularly, and it was considered to be a slow, stable anesthetic. It was used for what they called a cardiac anesthetic, which they thought was uh, a lot more resistant to swings in blood pressure. Uh, unfortunately, there was very slow emergence, as you can imagine, and reports of awareness, because opioids don't do anything to your memory or your awareness. There was also some muscle rigidity, and of course the muscle rigidity would lead people to give more muscle relaxant, which would lead to more awareness. We use fentanyl really as a short-acting drug, a single bolus with an onset of just maybe 10 or even 20 seconds, and recovery already begins within five minutes and is complete certainly within an hour. Now as you could go from a single dose to large doses or multiple doses or an infusion, then we start to see prolonged respiratory depression and a slower recovery, and then the recovery will be longer than just um, the 45 to 60 minutes we see with a single dose. Fentanyl is dosed as a premedication, usually 25 to 50 micrograms IV. You can give it as part of induction at a dose of 1 to 5 micrograms per kilogram. At our institution, we're closer to the 1 microgram per kilogram uh, dosing range. Intraoperatively, people will, will redose as necessary anywhere between half and two and a half micrograms per kilogram, um, all the way up to about three to five micrograms per kilogram per hour. And you can also run a fentanyl infusion. We do this a lot in long cases, especially neuro cases, um, or cases where we can't use paralysis, at a dose of somewhere between 0.5 and 2 micrograms per kilogram per hour. The book says you could go up to 10 micrograms per kilogram per hour, at which point I would be really concerned about buildup of fentanyl in a very long recovery period. The side effects, which we've already discussed, um, include chest wall rigidity, some myoclonus, 
of course, the nausea, the vomiting, the itching, and the respiratory depression. And actually, fentanyl and midazolam together can precipitate a very profound respiratory depression. They show a lot of synergy when they're given together. Sufentanil is related to fentanyl, is also synthetic, and it's about a thousand times more important than morphine, but otherwise it's very similar to fentanyl and maybe a little bit shorter acting, 30 minutes instead of 45 to 60 minutes. Alfentanil has a potency somewhere between morphine and fentanyl, but a very, very fast elimination half-life, probably due to its low pKa, and it has a very short duration even in large doses. Many people use it as an infusion. I've actually never uh, worked someplace where alfentanil was available, so I can't tell you any more about it from my personal experience. And it can be used to reduce MAC by up to about 70%. Remifentanil, whose brand name is Altiva, is an ultra-short-acting opioid. And unlike all the others, its metabolism occurs not in the liver, but via ester hydrolysis, by blood and tissue esterases. Now this isn't pseudocholinesterase, which we learn about with um, succinylcholine, but these are other esterases that are in the blood and in the tissues, and they metabolize fentanyl, much more, remifentanyl, much more quickly than it could be redistributed to other tissues. So this is one case where the termination of effect is actually due to metabolism and not due to redistribution. Remifentanil is almost always given as an infusion. In fact, if you give a really fast bolus, people can become rigid. And a bolus of remifentanil is usually given over about 30 to 60 seconds. At high doses, you can decrease MAC by up to 90%. And so this drug has been used very well as an adjunct to general anesthesia. An induction dose of remifentanil would be about half to one microgram per kilogram over 30 seconds. You can run an infusion uh, at starting at 0.1 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and that plus a low propofol infusion can be a TIVA, a total IV anesthetic. And at much lower doses, you can do a MAC with remifentanil about 0.05 to 0.25 mics per kilogram per minute. I've gone even less. I've gone to 0.01 or even 0.005 mics per kilogram per minute, uh, especially when other drugs are on board because you will get very profound respiratory depression. Fortunately, it will be short acting because this drug is metabolized by the ester hydrolysis. One of the negative side effects of remifentanil is what's called post-operative hyperalgesia, that people actually can have more pain in the recovery room than they would have had if you hadn't used remifentanil at all. Some people think this is an acute opioid tolerance. Another side effect we see is nausea. And remifentanil is a relatively expensive drug, so you'll find if you use this drug for an eight-hour case, you'll go through an awful lot of it. And you may question what the benefit of using such a short-acting drug is for a long case. Take a moment here to think if you have any questions about the material. You can bring those questions with you to class or be in touch with me and we can discuss it together. Now we've talked about all the opioid agonists, but there are also drugs called opioid partial agonists. These drugs also bind to the mu receptor, but they have a lower efficacy. They can't achieve the same high level of effect that the strong agonists like morphine and Dilaudid are able to achieve. A lower maximum effect at high doses when given alone, which makes them good drugs for mild to moderate pain. These are drugs that you'll often see people going home with after a procedure. And it's interesting, if you give a full agonist and a partial agonist, both competing for the same receptor, so the partial agonist is actually competing with the, with the full agonist, and so it's acting a little bit like a competitive antagonist. Right? The receptor can only be occupied by one or the other, and some of these partial agonists are taking up receptor spaces. And so actually you'll get a net decrease in the clinical effect compared with the full agonist alone, and we call this a ceiling effect. So when a patient is taking a lot of uh, partial agonist, they may have a lower risk of respiratory depression. Now, obviously, if you give enough morphine, you can overcome this ceiling effect. But you should be aware of the, this interesting interaction whereby a partial agonist actually acts like a competitive antagonist. Theoretically, if you have someone who's very addicted to opioids and you give them a partial agonist, 
you could precipitate a state of withdrawal. Codeine is a good example of one of these drugs. It has good oral bioavailability. It's a good cough suppressant. It provides mild to moderate analgesia. It's actually converted in the body to a form of morphine. And you may run into people who tell you, I can't take codeine, it doesn't work for me. And they may be telling you the truth. 10% of Caucasians do not have the proper enzyme to convert uh, codeine into morphine, in which case they would have to pick a different medication. When this drug is mixed with acetaminophen, it's called Tylenol number 2 or number 3 or number 4. Usually Tylenol number 3 is what you'll see. Hydrocordone is a partial agonist, also known as Lortab, and when it's mixed with acetaminophen, it's called Vicodin. Oxycodone and Oxycontin, these are the exact same drug. The Oxycontin is just extended release. And when mixed with acetaminophen, this is called Percocet or Percodan. Tramadol is an interesting drug. Tramadol, for a while, was thought to be not an opioid. But in fact, it is an opioid. It has some mu activity, but it's much less potent than morphine. It has other actions as well on spinal norepinephrine and serotonin, and this multimodal effect may be why it's a good pain medication. It does have the usual side effects of nausea. Um, it may cause seizures at very high doses, and it may interact with Coumadin. Propoxyphene, also known as Darvon, is a drug that's not on the market anymore. Uh, mixed with acetaminophen, it was called Darvacet, and it was taken off the market because it caused arrhythmias. Now, when we talk about all of these different opioids, it would be nice to have a way of comparing one opioid with another. And this is done by looking at equianalgesic doses of opioid analgesics. Now, there is a rule of thumb, which I alluded to before, which is that 100 of meperidine is equal to 10 of morphine, is equal to 1 of hydromorphone, is equal to 0.1 milligrams or 100 micrograms of fentanyl, which is equal to 10 micrograms of sufentanyl. So that's a very nice rule of thumb, and it works pretty well. If you want more details, you get an actual equianalgesic opioid dosing table, which will convert between different IV or IM doses, different parental doses, and oral doses as well. There's more than one version of this table, so you, there's no exact science to this, but this is the thing we're looking at. So for example, if a patient is taking uh, 30 milligrams of morphine by mouth every six hours, so 30 times 4 is 120 milligrams of morphine every day. So we could say that's equal to 40 milligrams of IV morphine every day. And then we could convert that to hydromorphone or whatever drug we're using. Say that's equal to 6 milligrams of hydromorphone every day. Each opioid binds to a different subset of different receptors in its own unique way. And for that reason, patients don't always have the identical response to every single opioid. And when a patient switches from one opioid to another, they will lose some of the tolerance that they've developed to the first opioid. And for that reason, when we introduce a different drug, we usually cut their dose by somewhere around 25 to 50 percent. So if this patient was getting the equivalent of, we said, 40 of morphine a day, we wouldn't go ahead and give them six of hydromorphone a day. We might start at three or four milligrams, expecting that they'll have less tolerance to the hydromorphone than to the morphine that they've been taking for so long. We'll stop here. Again, if you have questions, just let me know. We'll bring them to class, and we'll pick up in the next section.